Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. You might know him as Rob Malda, or you might know him as Commander Taco, but Rob Malda was the founder of the great geek social website Slashdot.org. Slashdot recently turned 20 years old, and Rob commemorated this in a great Medium post, and so I reached out to him to get him to tell us the whole story of one of the first great social media websites, Slashdot. Rob Malda, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Hello, hello. Uh, so I think, since you and I are roughly the same age, this is a good, you're a good person to ask this question to, to start out. Um, what would you say was the first computer that was yours? Like, this is Rob's computer. The first computer that would be, well, okay, I'll, I'll split this off because uh, I learned a program on a TRS-80 mm. uh, in elementary, but that was not mine. That was like in a lab that like was like a, I don't know, like a community center. Uh, and then the first computer that I got regular access to, my dad would bring home a compact luggable PC mm-hmm. and when I say PC I mean pre XT pre AT like it had like a like a three or four inch green LCD screen or not LCD like a green CRT like it was this gigantic like 80 pound luggable thing with a gigantic floppy drive uh-huh. uh, and uh, I would program on that on weekends so while technically not mine that was the first computer that kind of uh, I began to call it my own uh, and then the first computer that would really, truly, honestly be mine, uh, it would probably be, uh, I think in seventh grade, I had a 286 uh, with a modem, uh, and I was very thrilled to have a VGA screen. But at that point, I was already quite technically savvy. So while it was the first computer that I owned, it wasn't really my first computer because I was I would I had been programming for years on uh, XTs, and uh, I had a I had a compact luggable like with a like a plasma screen that was all shades of red like the (laughs) least the least possible uh visual thing that you could see like like eyes are not meant to focus on red (laughs) um you you mentioned that you're programming early uh what what are you like basic pascal that sort of thing yeah yeah uh i mean everybody in the 80s learns to program in basic i suppose if you're a you know a fourth grader right uh and uh but uh you know after that i fell in love with pascal that was really my language all through high school uh what about first uh online experience were you a bbs kid oh, pro- yeah. prodigy CompuServe? what 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 was your jam uh, I never had access to uh, the prodigies and to the compu serves and such because those things would cost money. Uh, but what you could do is take your uh, Hayes uh, 1200 baud modem and war dial uh, all your local phone numbers and see what shows up. Uh, and I was fortunate enough that in uh, my area code that I could call without paying a long distance fee, there were uh, a dozen or so BBSs. Uh, and uh, it turned out that they were inhabited actually by a few folks from my middle school, uh, including some of the folks that went to go on to form Slashed Out with me. So mm. uh, seventh, eighth grade, uh, I was big into BBSs. Uh, we had a number of local ones. And I think even by eighth grade, I, I think I was paying for my own phone line so that I could run a BBS, uh, you know, for the, the 18 hours a day where I wasn't on my computer. My computer was on and running a BBS. And you're also, um, you're... Uh doing your own shareware and stuff too like I oh think yeah you, yeah, yeah. So, super sweet i i wrote uh actually i should google it and find it i'm sure it doesn't exist anymore uh i had uh i wrote uh if you remember from way back in the day there was an ANSI art program called the draw uh oh vaguely vaguely yeah 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 somebody somebody in your uh in your community is old enough to remember the draw <laughs> uh, but uh i loved the draw but there was no equivalent for ANSI music uh, so I made like a little keyboard simulator uh, that would record ANSI music 
Uh, and I think I made about $80 off of that. And I was going to sell it for like five bucks a copy. So I probably sold, you know, like 16 copies or something like that. Well, so, it, oh yeah. In those days it would have been someone mailed you a check too, right? Oh yeah. I, I would yeah. physically get checks in the mail and it'd be like, yeah, I'm going to go buy a Butterfinger. <laughs> All right. So, um, let's yada yada a bit, but let's take it. You go to college, you go to hope, which I know is on the, the West coast of Michigan. Um, <laughs> So what what year would that be like? Uh, 92, 93 maybe? Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. Um, so this is right around the time that they start wiring dorm rooms for uh, actual internet access, right? Yeah, it's pretty sweet. My my first year, I was in a dorm that did not have internet access, but we knew which one was going to have internet access. And so myself and a large portion of the computer science department all picked the floor. Weird. Uh, they all picked the floor. But it was it was the nerd dorm too. Uh, we we the place was Voorhees, which is where all the Dungeons and Dragons players lived. Uh, so the, it was already well equipped, uh, uh, at least in terms of the the human beings who chose to occupy it. Uh, and then like the people on our floor uh, was like half the computer science department, and then uh, I think maybe. Three of the four or five people that were originally on Slashdot were all living on that floor for that year. Hmm. See, I got to I got there about nine. Well, not hope, but I got to college about ninety six, and it was a similar thing. It was like there was one building that was super wired, and so everybody that went there self selected for geeks, and we just did you know crazy all night doom and quake battles and things like that but right yeah. the previous year we had been we would like run ethernet cables up and down the halls because we were i mean my friends and i we were living in the same dorm it was just a different building but we would like drag ethernet cables up and down the halls so that we could you know have well, right. I, I know, like uh, uh back then duke nukem mm -hmm, uh mm -hmm. was a was a big one and rise of the triad we played a heck of a lot of that and obviously like doom and quake and well, stuff right you had to you had to string your own cables because there's no wi-fi at this point and like oh yeah to network you got to literally <laughs> make the network yourself right 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 i mean by the by the end uh one of the guys um uh nate and kurt uh two of the original block stackers uh they they had like a double-sized dorm room like a very large one and we all worked at a place that was in the process of deprecating lots of old technology. And uh, like they, they, we would like take old servers and like rig them up in our dorm rooms. And like they had like old uh, terminals, like old dumb terminals, like strung all over their rooms. Uh, and this is by the time that we had ethernet. So, uh, or with internet access. So, you know, we've all got like, you know, late eighties uh, terminals floating around our dorm rooms. You know, uh, you might have told this story a thousand times, but I, I couldn't find it when I was researching you. So, uh, where does the where does Commander Taco come from? Uh, all right, a thousand and one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, 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 Commander Taco is from a Dave Barry book. Uh, ah, yes, it's, I love uh, it. how yeah. to get ahead in business, I think, or maybe how to win at dating or something. One of those books. If you Google, uh, if you Google a couple of the keywords out of this, you'll find it. But uh, it's. Uh, uh, it was uh, a list of like the top 10 restaurants that you never want to take a first date. Uh, <laughs> so unsurprisingly, you should never take your first date to a restaurant called the commander taco. <laughs> so you end up, are, are you using that as like a, a handle and screen names and things like that online? Well, up until that, up until I got full fledged internet access, I had been going by the name Icarus, uh, like mm. on my local BBSs, but yeah. unsurprisingly there was a very large number of Icarus I, uh, uh -huh. that previously existed on the worldwide internets yeah uh so i became commander taco uh probably 95 96 is what it's when i started using it uh it was no there wasn't there was no name collisions well that's funny because i feel like nowadays commander taco would be the one and the ikari would be a little more rare but who knows my uh, name does get collided on on many many services and it frustrates me to no ends like it, it still angers me at a like on some sort of primordial level that i don't have like commander taco at gmail because uh, somebody freaking ninja that. <laughs> um, yeah, like because uh, I got Brian MCC on Twitter, but I don't have it for for Gmail either. So I got Commander Taco uh, on Twitter, but I had to get it from a squatter. Yeah, yeah. Um, so all right, let's do let's let's get into rolling up into uh, Slash Dot. So I guess you you've got a homepage once once you've got the the internet connection, you're 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 starting to experiment with the web. I, I imagine. 
Yeah. Um, so in this era, we're thinking, I guess we're thinking 95, 96, uh, through the computer science department, I already had a personal homepage, uh, knew how to program simple CGI apps, uh, and knew how to write HTML and such. Uh, I, you know, given that this was, you know, the bleeding edge of high tech uh, in 1996, I was doing a little bit of freelance consulting work uh, with it. I worked for an ad agency. I worked, I did a bunch of freelance jobs for like local businesses doing, uh, you know, making their websites. Uh, so I was, I was super elite and super savvy back then. And so where, what's the, what's the inspiration for, I want to have my own website under my own domain get out from under the the university account well it would, i would actually step a little bit backwards uh yeah we please moved, we moved off campus uh-huh. uh which meant we lost internet access oh, uh, right. for, for our 24 7 you know always on computers so uh i wanted desperately to have a machine that could live 24 7 uh on the internet that I, I could have root access to because obviously the computer science department wasn't super hot on uh, letting the students uh, run unfettered over their uh, over their systems, and so I got I I, I did some freelance work uh, f- and swapped out uh, uh, some code for uh, a Deck Alpha Maltia that I could like leave online twenty four seven. Once I had a machine that lived twenty four seven on the internet, uh, I you know was like, well, I might as well have a domain name uh, because that would be fun, uh, and. Uh, there you go. <laughs> and again, at the at the at the outset, is it just well? This is my homepage. Like, where does it change? Like, because okay, I'm gonna step back a second. So this is 96, come on, come on, Brian. Ninety six, ninety seven. So blogging isn't even a word yet, right? Yeah, that's like two thousand two. Yeah, exactly. So how does your website evolve? Like, is it just you know I'm sharing fun links, and then your friends are sharing those links, and then. Like how how does how does slash dot evolve into a thing that's not just Rob's homepage? Well, my my personal homepage. I was I was writing open source software, making contributions of minor significance to uh, various uh, open source projects. I was very involved in uh, uh, like GUI stuff, like X interfaces and stuff. And uh, I had a sort of a news page on my personal home pages, which, which at the time lived on campus or the, on the campus computers. Uh, it was called Chips and Dips. And mm. I would post, you know, I've got a new version of this thing that I wrote if you would like to download it. And then also like, I saw this terrible movie. Uh, would you like to know what I thought of it? Uh, so it would be in some ways a blog before they were called that. Uh, but it was maintained all with HTML uh, and it had no fancy administrative UI or anything. And it was a royal pain in the butt to... Uh, 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 you know, try to edit and maintain, you know, once it got over, you know, hundreds of entries, you know, maintaining all that HTML became an annoying pain. So when I got, uh, a dedicated server, uh, uh, that I then had root access to and could, you know, experiment to my dirty heart's content, uh, one of the first things that I did was migrate all of that stuff over there and start and get code together for that. I mean, I was also like, doing freelance work uh, for ad agencies and stuff. So like, like I was building up libraries of like Perl CGI and stuff that, you know, I was using for odds and ends. Uh, and it became like a research project, I guess, to learn how to do uh, certain things uh, to automate the whole process. Uh, so, and that, that puts me into, I mean, pretty much uh, the start of slash dot, you know, the, the late 97 era. And, but it evolving into like sharing news stories, like, was that just something that happened organically? Like, I'm, what I'm hunting around for here is because sometimes it's like there's a eureka moment where people are like, oh, this is I can do this. Or sometimes people say, you know, it sort of evolved into this without me even knowing it. And I'm I'm curious, like w- how you remember it. Slashdot something. had a few eureka moments, but I wouldn't necessarily say that this was the one because what was happening on Chips and Dips uh, was kind of a no brainer. I was just babbling about what I thought about things and sharing links when I found them that I thought were cool, Mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, I mean, what the web essentially is, uh, if you, you know, erase the fact that now everybody has to install a proprietary app in order to do anything. Uh, the, at that point, um, it was just, it was kind of a no brainer. It was sort of an extension of hanging out in IRC with your friends, you know, an IRC chat log, uh, you know, it, it doesn't stretch back, 
you know, to yesterday uh, than my news page would. Uh, so, but I mean, there were eureka moments for me, uh, uh, but a lot of those involved like the moderation system and the submissions bin and different processes that I could use to optimize how the site became more of a sort of an interactive social experiment and less of, uh, less of, I'm going to write, you know, somewhere between 100 and 1000 words Uh about something that mattered to me in the last 12 hours. Well, well, we'll get to like the user accounts and moderating and things like that. But so I, I, I saw a speech you gave, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, um, maybe one of the Eureka moments was, uh, around the time of, of Netscape, uh, open sourcing their browser because you had been writing about that. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, kind of my dumb luck moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I wrote, you know, uh, a page or two essay uh, saying, so at the time, I guess, uh, to put on your history hat, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, the Netscape web browser, which was the sort of dominant web browser in this era, uh, had begun to lose ground to the evil Microsoft Internet Explorer, uh, of course, owned and operated uh, by that evil Seattle corporation, which all Slashdot users loved to hate. Uh, and, uh, you know, my proposal, uh, in an essay was that the only way that Netscape would be able to compete, uh, with the theoretically limitless resources of Microsoft would be to release an open source project around their web browser. Uh, and I got contacted, uh, even by people in the organization almost immediately like, yeah, we're talking about that internally right now. Uh, and, Within like a day or two of me publishing that piece, they actually announced an official decision to do it. And my dumb luck thing was, I think it was mostly just I happened to say it at the right time. Uh, I don't think that I convinced anybody through my incredibly precise logic and powers of persuasion. Uh, But a, a few mainstream media sources uh, graciously credited me uh, with, uh, uh, inspiring that idea in some way, or at least being partially connected to it. And, you know, maybe it didn't hurt, but, uh, uh, I, I don't take any credit for that, but the serendipity of it worked out in my favor, uh, because our traffic, uh, probably doubled or tripled, uh, over the course of the following few days where we went from a bunch of nerds from IRC channels, uh, to a place where like, maybe savvy, journalisty, techie people. You know, the dude on the newspaper who's got the tech beat, mm-hmm. uh, now he's joining into the Slashdot crowd, uh, you know, and generally raised the IQ or at least the uh, the circulation potential of our content. Uh, and then for the following year or two, uh, traffic was basically a unyielding roller coaster. Well, you said we, and uh, I guess we haven't pointed this out, but I, I, very early on, uh, you're doing this with with a lot of your friends, right? Oh no, it was all me. Uh, I did everything all myself. Oh, uh, I thought I'm you just, guys uh, you, you guys just, left college I'm... and and <laughs> you were in this house together. Oh yeah, I'm just I'm just so great. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we uh, I would say about uh, so I mean even right at the beginning. Uh, Several of my friends were involved uh, contributing bits of code or uh, I mean, Hemos uh, gave me some cash when we registered the domain name. Uh, uh, everybody was contributing contributing little bits and pieces. Uh, it was for the first year or so very much the Rob show, I guess, uh, but with, with great assistance from a number of people uh, over the course of, uh, I would say, uh, maybe six, seven, eight months in. Uh, it became clear to me that this was beyond what a single uh, student, full, what a full-time student with a part-time job can mm-hmm, do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, over the course of the following year was sort of a, a bunch of baby steps in terms of forming a corporation, in terms of uh, um, I mean, ultimately I was the first person to be hired. And that was like, I don't know, two years later. Uh, where we actually had enough revenue that we could pay one person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it took a while to get to that point, but all the, the company was block stackers, uh, and, uh, uh, it was comprised primarily of my roommates. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, it was good times, man. Good times. 
Well, describe the Rob show or, or even what, what other people are doing. Is it just, is it just browsing all day and, you know, reading, uh, 200 articles and posting five or like, what, what, what is it like in those early days? Well, in the, so in maybe the first three to six months, uh, it's mostly engineering. Uh, it's me adding features, you know, oh, there's something wrong with the comment system. And one of my buddies was, you know, kind of wor- writing a lot of the code a lot around the comment system. And I was kind of writing the code around like the, the editorial process. Uh, but in like in the earliest versions of the system, people would email me the stories and I would post them uh, uh-huh. or I would find it on my own and post them. Uh-huh. Uh, but I, for the first like several months, I was literally the only person who could post things. Uh, and then uh, six months in, uh, if I remember right, it was spring break. Uh, I basically, uh, I, I basically rewrote almost the entire site, like over the course of a week, uh, and, uh, added the vast majority of things, uh, that from the back end were necessary in order to carry the site sort of to the next level. Uh, and by that, I mean like, enough of a user account system that multiple editors could have user accounts Uh and post stories under their own pseudonyms. uh, And perhaps more importantly, a web form uh, that you could fill out with your super sweet URL. And then uh, you could submit that to us. And then it didn't have to always be me looking at the story uh, because by that point, you know, I'm getting, you know, 30, 40, 50 submissions a day and picking the five or 10. I'm not necessarily going and looking for them myself. It's not an active process. It's a passive process that occurs naturally along with my normal travelings during the day. Uh, So it was very easy work. Hey, you know, it it was as easy then as, you know, like I found this URL, I would tweet it uh, would be, you know, uh, 15 years later. Well, you know what's fun to do. Um, describe describe slash dot if I'm um, if I'm just one of your readers, um, and I become a fan of slash dot, and I start going every day, and then am I able to sign up for a user account right away, or do I have to earn your trust through commenting? Like, if I'm a user in say '97 or whatever that first year was, um, what can I do if I if I become a super <laughs> slash dot head? Well, the, the first, for the first nine months, there were no user accounts save for like mine. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you basically could type in your name, uh, when you posted your comment, you know, I'm Fred and I'd post my comment. And if you left the field blank, it would just say your name is anonymous coward. Uh, and so that, that was for like for the first year, uh, for this first nine months, uh, for the first, uh, six months, maybe four months, if you had a story idea that you wanted on Slashdot, you emailed Rob. Uh, and then Rob would pick it and post it. Uh, then, uh, over the course of, uh, those first nine months, then I add the ability for you to submit via a web page and then for multiple editors to participate in the process of selecting the stories that we're going to post. And then around the nine month mark, we add user accounts so you can log in. And we actually kind of did that. We did it for a lot of reasons, but frankly, one of the first ones was that people kept posting as commander taco. Mm. Uh, and they would say like, this is an official thing or a correction, but they would use my name and I'm like, come on, that's not cool. Uh, so we, knowing at that point that, you know, the, the, the early versions of trolling were occurring in the forums that I had to create some sense of authenticity, you know, to these nicknames. Uh, so then that gets you about nine months and then, Within uh, 12 months, the earliest versions of the the moderation system are in place. Uh, So then uh, initially, uh, basically the same group of people that I'm talking about, my roommates and then a few friends that we trust are sort of marking uh, comments that are good and bad, but there's not really any system behind it. Uh, It's mostly like these comments get, you know, uh, raised or lowered, but it's like an internal database thing. Uh, It doesn't really do much on the user experience except for like in extreme cases. And then we take all of the users who we determine have participated positively. uh, And this is then maybe uh, maybe 16 months, uh, 18 months in. uh, And then there were 400 of them at that point. Uh, And that was the first time where the the actual moderation system, the forum, becomes completely out of our own direct control. Mm. Uh, So at that point, we have 400 people 
350 of which we've never met. Right. Uh, who are now, uh, they're not necessarily in the driver's seat, but they have access to uh, the air conditioner and the, the, the heating controls. <laughs> they can change the stereo. You know, they have, they have power uh, over the system. So what you're uh, saying is, it, is, is at that point, if I'm one of the 400, I can get a story on the front page. Well, in that, it, 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 that wouldn't give you special priority in that way. Okay. But if you found somebody who was uh, an idiot, uh, you could moderate them down and squelch their opinion uh, gotcha. out of forums. Uh, anybody could submit a story. Uh, and frankly, anybody always could. Uh, and it was actually kind of a uh, important thing to me that I tried not to show favoritism uh, for the story selection process. That actually became... Uh, kind of one of my, uh, I don't know, one of the, one of the lines in the sand that I never wanted to cross. I did, I really tried not to show favoritism to publications, to, uh, to individual users. I always felt that every individual story should stand on its own. Uh, it's a good story or it's not. And I don't care if you're the Pope or if, uh, you're, uh, you know, some guy, uh, who's, you know, scribbling, uh, his story submission by carrier pigeon. I'm sort of, this is kind of derailing the, the what you're on about, but um, when you're picking the stories, was there any sort of thinking that went into it? Like, were there were you thinking, okay, this is a story that people will love and will get lots of traffic, or are you just picking stories that you think are interesting? Like, um, was there any editorial involved in, in, in the early stuff? Well, I mean, the, for, I mean, I always felt that for my duration of my time at Slashdot, my criteria was stuff Rob's, Rob likes. Uh, it was just, am I personally interested in, or not, in it or not? Uh, over time, that definition expanded. Uh, and uh, there were certain subjects on Slashdot that I wasn't particularly interested in, but I gave some of my editors leeway. Uh if one is more interested in physics, then go ahead, post some physics stories. I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't understand physics particularly well, but all right, you know, you, you know it and I hired you because you're a geek with, uh, with the right mindset. Um, there were other cases where the subjects that I was interested in, frankly, didn't jive with the Slashdot community. Uh, the simplest, the most well-known example is probably anime. Uh, I went through a phase where I was watching tons of anime series and I kept trying to post them on Slashdot and with the exception of uh, Miyazaki films uh, the Slashdot audience didn't really care uh, we could just never get traction on those uh, and I ended up making another site uh, just so that I had to play an outlet uh, to put content about anime uh, because I was you know watching all these series and I wanted to talk about it okay so before we move on describe for me again uh, as if I'm in, in uh, the late nineties, uh, the, the, the moderation system and the karma system and, and things like that was, do you develop those in response to managing just the, the, the traffic and the amount of content that's coming in, or is it an, an, an attempt to, um, regulate the community and regulate bad behavior? Like where does, where does the moderation and the karma and all that stuff come from? I, it was a very uh, uh, evolved system. It was never designed. Uh, it was uh, a, a pretty clear signal response. Uh, for example, I mentioned a few moments ago uh, that at one point we had 400 moderators. Well, what we discovered fairly quickly is that uh, a few percent of them were assholes. Oh, are you? Do we swear on this podcast? Absolutely. Excellent. Fuck yeah. Don't don't uh, don't tell iTunes, but yes. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Uh, you don't want to get that other rating. Uh, I, I, I just clear. always I just always check clean and um, oh yeah totally yeah, clean right yeah exactly. uh, I said fudge my microphone there might have been <laughs> off on the microphone sibilance right 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 so um, uh, those four hundred people what we discovered is you know maybe a dozen of them were irresponsible with their power uh, and they had to be weeded out and that was a manual thing but we realized that that was an issue uh, likewise what we discovered is fairly quickly a few hundred of them almost immediately burnt out uh, and then never did it again and what ended up happening over the course of a month or so is that we had maybe 50 60 70 people who were reliably pretty decent moderators and actively contributing in the system so when the system went to its next generation sort of I learned from that incredibly insightful observation people get bored and some people are dicks uh, uh, you know, so I responded, you know, by designing the next version of the system 
to deal with that. Uh, the whole system is really like, uh, like you figure out that somebody is going to create, a, they're going to post under the, as the name Commander Taco, and you're going to be like, crap, that sucks. So then you create user accounts, and then you discover that uh, somebody's going to create the user account Commander Taco with a dot at the end. Uh, so you put uh, the parentheses with the user number after it, so you can see that Commander Taco one is different than Commander Taco dot nine thousand six hundred and forty two. Uh, and you discover that uh, some people get bored fairly quickly, uh, so you create a system whereby moderation is something that happens inter it, it happens once in a while, and it's not a permanent thing on uh, that's always a part of your slash dot experience. It keeps you, uh, oh sweet, I get to moderate today. Uh, so uh, it, it becomes something that is not a burden, so you don't get bored of it. And at the same time. Uh, you discover that uh, some of your users know an awful lot about encryption, uh, but are the least funny people on earth. And you'd really love it uh, if they moderated in stories about encryption, but don't moderate up that stupid, <laughs> stupid, stupid joke because your sense of humor is clearly broken. Uh, so you, you, the, every step of the system is is like we see a problem uh, and we try to solve it. Like, uh, um, how do you at some point you realize that you are uh, you have a system that's creating thousands of moderations a day and that is beyond what a mortal can manually look through especially right. given that at this point uh, our staff is non-existent for for this sort of thing uh, so you create uh, in our case the meta moderation system which basically shows users a bunch of sample moderations and says hey was this cool or not you know was that fair and then you can sort of look back and say, well, 98% of the time, you know, 99% of the time, your moderations are fair. Uh, so when you see any surprises in there, well, then you have a human look at it. Uh, and now suddenly you only have to look at a couple of dozen uh, moderations a week. And then you discover that, uh, you know, people who moderate badly pretty darn reliably moderate badly. So you make sure they never moderate again. <laughs> Uh, you know, every every version of the system uh, stands on the version before, and for five or six years, it's just just this unyielding signal response uh, of us making little tweaks left and right to make it more and more efficient, to efficiently use our readers' time, to minimize abuse, uh, but ultimately to make sure that your experience when you come to Slashdot for reading comments at least, uh, is, is a good one that you read, you know, you go to a slash dot story and you're going to see a bunch of good comments without wading through garbage like you would, well, frankly, on every system that's ever existed since. Right. Actually, we'll, we'll come back to this idea of, of what community was like then versus today, uh, towards the end here. But, um, so, I think everyone is familiar with the concept of getting slash dotted. I mean, that even has its own wiki entry, I think. Um, does it? I, I think it still does. Um, but so the, the idea is, is that, you know, before Facebook, obviously, before Dig even, like you guys are really the the, this, the first site that is is known for being able to just send a deluge of traffic and overwhelm people's servers I guess maybe the, you know if you got on the Yahoo homepage, if you got a link there, that that would do the same thing. But um, was there a moment for that? Was there a eureka? Holy, holy crap! We we we're an eight hundred pound gorilla in terms of of generating traffic or, or or generating interest in certain things. Was there a story or something like that where you remember? Wow, this is this is getting big. I don't know that there was a particular story uh, that was like this is the one that is causing the 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 internet to break. Uh, but I will say is that uh, by the time we get through like the the Mozilla Netscape open source thing and our traffic becomes something worth reckoning, um, I get an almost constant stream of emails from users asking me to cache the websites that I'm linking to because – 80% of them are just buckling immediately after they appear on the slash dot homepage. And I guess the main thing to remember here is that, uh, this is in an era that predates, uh, uh, Twitter it predates to you. You said even dig dig was like 10 years. It, later. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. I mean, this is, this is dig is so a different generation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
these, uh, you know, like so Slashdot was one of the first things that created a spike. Up until that point, uh, the largest websites, you know, your your news publications, you know, I guess maybe back then, your Hotwired uh, or your, uh, you know, whatever your publication was, those followed a traffic curve uh, that you could look at a nice little graph and see, oh, well, here's the curve. Our audience is going to sleep. Our audience is waking up. You know, you'd see a, you'd see like a nice bandwidth curve. Slashdot created these massive spikes. So a big website, like a huge website, might be getting 100 hits an hour or 100 hits, even 100 hits a minute. And then suddenly you get uh, 100 hits in one second. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is just not how webs how most websites were designed back then. The other thing to keep in mind is that Slashdot was linking to kind of often the obscure edges of the internet. You know, websites that maybe got... You know, they were there, you know, back then you'd have your little counter at the bottom of your uh, web page like this page got 38 hits. Uh, we'd link pages like that. And a page like that is not designed to suddenly get 100, 200, 300, I don't know, 5,000 hits in right. a 10 minute window. Because like would you suddenly be their what? their their previous their their the previous 12 months of traffic they would suddenly get all within 10 minutes. Right, because uh, like you they're probably running the machine under their desk and this is before the era of content delivery networks and so it's totally. like, Yeah, yeah. Come yeah. on, CDN, that's, that's <laughs> years later. That's that's high tech, man. Exactly. So, it was I guess it was easy to knock sites over. And I don't remember specific sites or specific stories doing that, but I mean, there was a point even like three or four or five months in, like, you got to cache these websites. You got to make copies because every story I look at is broken. Uh, and, you know, I, I never felt right doing that. I always felt that caching people's pages created uh, a different set of problems that I just didn't want to deal with. Okay. Well, what about uh, a moment when you realize, oh, this is a business? Um. There, there are a few of them. Uh, maybe my favorite was we got a check from an advertiser, and it was a real advertiser with like an actual amount of money. And uh, I went and bought a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "All right, uh, I can." Because we had our hardware needs were met at that moment, and I haven't taken. I had. I don't. I think at that point I hadn't taken a nickel uh, after like a year of running the site. I'm like, "All right, I will go and spend two hundred and fifty dollars on a little purple Stratocaster, which uh, has been lost to the ages." Well, you guys get acquired early on, like before before the bubble burst, right? Like ninety nine yeah. or something like that. Yeah, we got we got bought out in ninety nine. Uh, our problem was we were growing too fast to keep up. Uh, we, I mean, at that point, we had maybe four or five people who were full time employees, but it was pretty clear that you would need, you know, twenty uh, or thirty in order to in order to run what this thing was going to be. Uh, and maybe that was uh, a little too conservative. I think that, you know, had Slashdot, you know, gone after being like a 50 person company, uh, you know, maybe it would have uh, done a little better uh, longer term. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we basically came to the conclusion uh, in 99 that we either needed to hire 20 people uh, and become experts in a bunch of subjects that we weren't experts in, or we could find a company that already had hired those 20 people uh, and take advantage of their pre-existing infrastructure. And we were on the path towards hiring more people. Uh, but, uh, you know, we kept getting uh, uh, what we, suitors uh, emailing and knocking at the door uh, to see what uh, uh, to see if we would be interested. And at some point, we just decided that was the easier path. It was a good home. It, it's Andover.net, right? Uh, at the time, they were called Andover Advanced Technologies. Gotcha. Then they became Andover.net. Then they got bought by VA Linux Systems, which right. renamed itself to uh, uh, VA Systems, which renamed itself to SourceForge, then OSTG, no, OSDN, <laughs> then OSTG. Uh, then got bought. I, I think I worked it out that I had something like 14 different companies' mm -hmm. uh, names on my business card while I did the same job. And do they all just generally let you keep running it uh, without much interference? For those first few years, it was fairly hands-off. Uh, they gave us some engineering resources, uh, and uh, we just kind of ran as best we could. Uh, it was it was a mixed bag. I mean, like, 
there was a point, and I won't name names, but there was a point where we had a systems administrator who didn't know what they were doing and we needed load balancing and the, the load balancing was broke for months, you know, and like you, there was a percentage of slash dot traffic going to null pages, uh, like a significant percentage uh, because this uh, load balancer was misconfigured. And like, so like there were things like that where like, so this person lived in a different city than me and was reporting to a different person because it was a resource shared by the network. So things like that were really hard. But during that era, they were very hands off with the editorial component, which was the most important thing to me. Uh, I never wanted corporate influence to corrupt uh, the integrity of uh, Slashdot or to jeopardize the desires and the needs of the Slashdot community. Um, again, in this uh, video, I should probably put a link to it in the show notes that I, um, that I saw you give a speech. You mentioned that there were uh, two other big traffic doubling events uh, that slash that, I, I don't know what the word is, covered or whatever. But I, I am super interested in this idea of, um, you know, now we experience news events online, but the, the first people to do that were people like you. So those two events, I think, were Columbine and 9-11. So if you want to just tell me about those two events and like what what you did on slash dot around those and, and what it was like when those things happened columbine was interesting because uh the slash dot community reacted to it in a way that was very different from the mainstream media uh the slash dot audience immediately latched onto uh the the narrative of a couple of kids who had been bullied uh and that then became uh, uh, sort of a story, you know, where we talked about how one of the shared threads between a huge percentage of the slash dot audience is that we were bullied in high school because we weren't the cool kids. Uh, and the, the, what came out of that story, you know, for better or for worse, cause you know, more came out about the Columbine story over time. Uh, but at the time, uh, this was a lot of this was led by, uh, John Katz, who was, uh, writing stories. He, he, he wrote uh, a series of articles, uh, Voices from the Hellmouth, uh, where he was really talking about, you know, the, the, you know, the shared experience of being, you know, kind of a bullied kid. Uh, and Slashdot, the audience reacted to that. And they reacted in a lot of ways, good and bad. Uh, some people were just like, shut up, John, we're sick of this. Let's go talk about, you know, the next version of the Linux kernel that's coming out tomorrow. Uh, but every time we posted these stories, the server would kind of slow down and slow down and slow down and buckle because they were reliably getting, you know, a thousand comments. And the system was fine when you had a few hundred comments on the story, but not so fine when you started having a few thousand. Uh, that was uh, that was the first major uh, traffic event after uh, maybe the, the Netscape story. 9-11 was uh, uh, a different beast entirely because that's that's uh, uh, at that point we're a pretty mature infrastructure and I have a team of uh, three or four really skilled engineers uh, during the Columbine era. It's still me doing most of the engineering. Uh, I have help, but not much uh, by the nine 11 era. I'm more of a manager, and, but that was uh, for us. I mean, the story notwithstanding, CNN went down. All of the mainstream news sites just started crashing left and right. Uh, and we spent the entire day basically on the editorial side trying to scrape together whatever facts we could and update the page. And then on the engineering side, turning off anything that we could find that could be turned off in order to make the site continue to function and stay stable. And we were pretty successful at that. Uh, we probably had like double or triple our uh, our hits record that day. Uh, but we didn't know because one of the first things that we turned off was any set of logging because logging was not fast enough to keep up. <laughs> so we have no idea uh, how many pages we served that day, but it was, you know, it was, it was millions uh, in an era where we were serving, you know, maybe a million on a good day. Well, yes, but also, you know, this, my memory of it, uh, you know, by, 2001 2002 like you, you, this you're the site that i go to every single day um in that era like did you have a sense of that that like you had this sort of power online um we're, we're, we're like you know pr people approaching you guys saying like write about us and that sort of thing what was what was that like um you know when it's running it's a it's a major site it's a company at that point 
Well, yeah, I mean, that was a, a problem that occurred. I mean, even probably within six or seven months, we get uh, what we later started referring to as shills, uh, you know, who are, you know, pitching their stories, their press releases or whatever, and doing this at varying degrees of success and subtlety. Some people are being completely deceptive and other people are being completely uh, honest and forthright about their intent. Uh, and that becomes just kind of part of it. You have to learn who's trying to play you and who's honest. And I developed a really bad habit uh, in that era, which is I started ignoring bylines uh, because I stopped being able to, there were, there were, you'd, you'd see people that, and when I say violence, I don't necessarily mean on the, the source material, or I would mean like in the submissions page to Slashdot, uh, because I wanted to be impartial, uh, to the story submitter and you would get, you know, a press release guy who would submit his press release and then you'd get, you know, some 15 year old nerd who submitted the exact same story, maybe in, even to the exact same article. And I had to learn to be agnostic to that, you know, uh, and just totally make my selections based on the value of the thing that I was looking at. Uh, so I think that for the most part, I was pretty successful because my, uh, my bullshit detector is incredibly efficient. Uh, I mean, certainly we were duped, uh, more than once, but I mean, uh, I don't know how many stories were on the site when I left, but it was, you know, like 100,000, 100, 150,000 or something. And I had posted like 14,000 stories. I, I did all right in terms of success rates. Yeah, yeah. But did you feel did you feel that you were shaping uh, opinion, uh, at least within nerd circles? Did you feel a sense of, I don't know. Oh, pa definitely. Power, we, yeah. Yeah, we, we knew, we knew. And that's, I think, why even early on, uh, I started really putting in controls to keep to keep the guys who had editorial power honest uh, to make sure that what they were doing was ethical and fair. Uh, I've made my share of mistakes in my life, but I uh, I think that anybody who worked with me at Slashdot on the editorial side would probably have a story or two about me being an absolute dick about no you can't do that because you got to that's not right that's not ethical that's not moral uh i had a very strong sense of right and wrong at least in terms of because i knew that i was you know i was holding a, a machine gun in a universe of, of squirt guns and I, I had to be very careful with that power and while i could trust myself uh as i gave more of that power to other people uh, I knew what I was entrusting them with. Uh, our process for hiring new editorial staff, uh, even that was like kind of crazy. We would uh, uh, have people like write fake stories for us, and then I would anonymously, or I would, I would send the fake stories written by an applicant to the existing team and have them evaluate these stories without knowing anything about the people they were evaluating uh, to just see can they pick stories that are appropriate for Slashdot, you know, without that, those biases? Because, you know, everybody comes in with their own biases. But I was crazy obsessive about that. Because, uh, yeah, we were, I mean, it was scary. We had a lot of power uh, uh, for, you know, for a good 10 years there. Uh, it, we, it was an insanely powerful venue. Uh, I don't really think it's that anymore. But uh, for a while there, man, it was scary powerful. And I... I wanted nothing but to do the best I possibly could with that. And I mean, I, I did all right most of the time. Uh, I got a few mistakes in there, but. <laughs> yeah, in a in a different interview, I, I, I think you said words to the effect that you felt like there was a period of stagnation at some point um, with, the, with the site, either in terms of maybe you're, you were getting bored or, you know, definitely you're maybe not keeping up with like, you know, the rise of Ajax and things like that. And, um, did just personally, um, cause you do it for what? 10 years, 14, 14. Um, was there burnout for you? Was there, I, I need to evolve into something sure. else. Yeah, sure. I mean, there was definitely burnout. Uh, and we went through, there were a lot of different things. Uh, one of the biggest things I think is, and you mentioned Andover earlier, and they were acquired and bought and sold 
so many times during that era. Uh, during some eras, we were the golden child that upon which the hopes and dreams and future of the company depended on. And in other eras, we were the, the redheaded stepchild that the company was stuck with. Uh, this burden that they just had to continue to maintain. I mean, we were, we, we were both at different eras. Uh, and I, you know, I, for better or for worse, uh, we ran the thing on a shoestring budget uh, the whole time I was there. And I think what happened for us is that while our, while our technical people were amazing, uh, we were running, you know, one of the largest sites on the internet uh, with an unbelievably tiny staff, uh, like our engineering staff, I think at our biggest, maybe you could say our engineering staff was like five people. Uh, and that was, you know, like, and this is in an era when like, we would be like, you know, in the top 20 or 30 websites on the internet in terms of traffic, uh, we were gigantic and we were being run with no resources. So none of our technical decisions were made you know, how does this matter six months from now? They were all made. We've got to fix this. We've got to do this now because the site has a problem. And that just built up an amazing amount of technical debt over the course of uh, those years. Uh, so by the time, I guess if you're trying to think about, you know, the starter pistol on like Ajax technologies, you know, you have like Gmail and uh, Google Maps yeah. are kind of like two of the first big ones to catch on. We simply don't have the technical mm. bandwidth to try to apply those kinds of uh, technologies. And if you're talking about socially, uh, you mentioned Dig earlier. Uh, when Dig comes along, uh, was that maybe 2006, 2007, 2005, mm, somewhere 2005, in there? 2005, yeah. Uh, so when that comes along, we have, uh, not when that comes along, I'm kind of at, I've got to catch 22, right? Because first of all, I don't have the technical resources to actually really implement this stuff. Uh, and my other problem is that I now have a decade of legacy on how Slashdot operates and a uh, user population of, you know, a million people who expect Slashdot to operate a certain way. And I can't just go run around changing it without angering a sizable percentage of the audience. So not only do I have technical debt, but I have uh, a audience expectation or an audience obligation. It's like how every TV show that makes it to eight seasons, like most of the people that were there in season one is like, ah, it sucks now. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you can't make dramatic changes. You can't add characters and stuff and still keep your, uh, keep your core audience happy. Uh, so when, uh, dig and Reddit come along, we're kind of in a bad position because those, those sites function fundamentally differently on slash than Slashdot does. Slashdot is, uh, you know, you can say it tongue in cheek or not, but Slashdot has a very strong quality control mechanism, uh, which is basically you have two or three people on any given day who are reading everything and making sure that it meets a certain criteria, a certain consistency. Uh, Dig and Reddit don't have that. They have crowds. Now, Dig was, you know, I mean, they were a crowd. You say that with finger quotes around your head because there was a lot of editorial manipulations occurring there. And Reddit, I mean, when they started, they had uh, bots faking a lot of their early traffic. But that user expectation uh, uh, is different. The users expect different things. So, for example, you can hold Dig or Reddit to a different standard than you do Slashdot. Uh, so Slashdot's going to post 15 stories a day, but there's no reason Dig can't post 200. Uh, which means suddenly you can lower your standards. Like, who cares? This is just story number 138. It doesn't have to be that great. Whereas on Slashdot, if I post the 138th best story of the day, uh, the first 10 comments are going to be, why the hell is this on Slashdot? This is stupid. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a different set of user expectation. That's not a technical problem. That's a, that's a user problem. And we modeled all the traffic and we figured out where the sweet spots would be in terms of story posting, and we knew if we posted more stories, all that happened was we we didn't get more comments, we didn't get more discussion, we got basically the same amount of commentary, it would just be distributed across more stories, which meant the comments weren't as interesting. Uh, you, I, I mean, it's not, uh, obviously Slashdot still exists and, and, and is still a, a, a traffic site, um, but it, are you it almost sounds like you're saying that for you personally but then maybe even culturally like 
Slashdot had its era and then like the internet kind of evolved and moved on. Is that what you're kind of... Yeah, and that's a, that's a fair way to put it. I mean, Slashdot represents a snapshot in time. Slashdot was amazingly well-suited to the rise of the blogging era. Uh, in the, the, the blogging era was awesome because up until that point, you needed to have a certain technical expertise in order to have a, have a megaphone on the internet. Uh, the blogging era makes it so that now people, like before that, your expertise had to be technical. Now your expertise can be politics or uh, sports or whatever, and you have you know you, you know you might be clueless and inept technically speaking, but you can post that uh, onto the internet, and then a site like Slashdot can easily wade through that volume of content and be just fine. Uh, when you get to the dig Reddit era, uh, as opposed to I suppose the the true rise of social media. Uh, now suddenly there's just so much content that's out there, uh, that the, the, after, after, you know, four, four or five years of the rise of blogging, uh, there's, there's more content. And in the case of Reddit, especially, it becomes very well equipped at dealing with many, many subjects. Slashdot was always about the news for nerds. It was the tech angle. Uh, those other services were broader. And by that point in time, uh, the internet was capable of supporting every subject matter under the sun because it took a while for like the people who were knitters uh, to be on the internet. They weren't there in 1997. Right. Uh, but in 1997, everybody was technical, so that site could exist first. Had Slashdot had more technical resources, I think that it could have been a contender uh, throughout the sort of the dig Reddit era. Uh, where those are kind of the rising creatures uh, online, uh, but then utterly ill-equipped uh, for sort of the the rise of Twitter and then the I guess ultimately the fake news era. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I'm gonna we're gonna end with with talking about that. Um, so when do you when do you st step down with the day to day at uh, Slashdot? Uh, 2011, maybe. Wow. Okay. Um, so did. Tell me a little bit about uh, Washington Post Labs and and uh, your work after Slashdot. Uh, well, I took a lot of time off, mm -hmm. uh, and that was awesome. Uh, and then I worked uh, for the Post and for their their Labs division. Um, it, it that was a very different experience, and it was really just kind of awesome because I had spent. I mean, my joking tongue in cheek way of describing this is saying something to the effect of I spent the first uh, decade of my career uh, destroying traditional publishing. Uh, and, uh, you know, then I was, I, I, maybe I get to, you know, uh, try to help fix it. Atone uh, for that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. D d atonement. Uh, that's a good word. Uh, and, you know, you know, I, I, that was honestly what I wanted to do. Uh, unfortunately, I guess, or fortunately, uh, I also arrived, uh, or soon after my arrival, uh, Jeff Bezos bought the Washington post, uh, and the team that I was a part of, uh, did not go with, we were the labs group and that didn't go with the newspaper. Uh, that went with, uh, with the company that sold it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we were in the process of developing, uh, news apps at the time. Like, like Trove, right? Like Trove specifically was, yes. uh, was the thing that we worked on and a lot of really cool thoughts and ideas and development work went into that. Uh, but unfortunately for the universe, I guess, uh, maybe for me, most of all is that, you know, it was a couple of years too late because at that point, uh, Facebook and those guys have, you know, firmly entrenched as the, the, the five ton gorilla. And, uh, then without the Washington post as being part of the family, uh, you know, we lost some of our connection to help with, the. Uh, 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 sort of getting ourselves out there with, with them at our side. All right. So let's, let's talk about this because I feel like you probably more than just about anybody, um, has basic exactly 20 years of experience dealing with online communities, um, people's behavior, uh, uh online. Um, is, do you feel like, I, I know you're not running a community site at the moment, but do you feel like that there was a difference in the nature of how people behaved on the web 20 years ago versus today? I don't know if there was a difference. I think that, I think the difference is scale. 
uh, and maybe ease uh, efficiency expectation. Uh, I mean, in the earliest eras of uh, the internet, you have chat rooms and you have Usenet. Uh, and a lot of those concepts, a lot of the fundamental components of those systems, you know, carry forward into every community that will ever exist beyond that. Um, Slashdot tried to uh, put some guardrails on that system. And uh, one of the things that uh, I always thought was interesting is that Slashdot spent years and years and years developing guardrails uh, around these communities. And uh, what then happens is you see a small percentage of people who will do anything in their power to jump over whatever railing you put around them. Uh, so, I mean, I, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a novel in the story of, uh, like, Slashdot implements this defensive mechanism, and then some troll develops this tool, this automated tool, in order to get around that defensive mechanism. And you can the the trolls are working on this for different purposes. Some of them some of them exist uh, for fun, and some of them actually exist to promote an agenda. And uh, this sort of thing happens on Slashdot for years and years and years. So when Sites like Dig and Reddit come along. Uh, those guys, I felt bad for them because you know, the 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 community of people who were out there for mischief were running around with uh, you know the the social equivalent equi equivalent of nuclear weapons, and these guys now have to develop defenses against that, which we had the ability to develop in tandem. Uh, it's like what smallpox being uh, uh, brought over to North America, right? Uh, and, you know, it's something like that happening. Um, but then all all of those concepts, all of those the, whether it be it for mischief or true malice or evil, uh, those things all happened all along. I mean, you had people trolling Usenet forums in the '90s, sure, sure. Uh, and and that's not any different than uh, a government agent manipulating uh, Facebook results. I mean, in order to swing an election. I mean, technically, it's not. It, it's just the next logical steps or a hundred logical steps down the line. So. It's faster. It's harder uh, on both the offensive and the defensive sides. But I don't know that it's actually different. It's mm. just like everything else uh, you know, on the Internet. Uh, it just continuously gets faster. Uh, and then sort of you have another line on the other side, which is uh, in, you know, let's say in the 90s, uh, the average Internet user was technically savvy, uh, you know, uh, and by the time you get to uh, the uh, late uh, or by the mid uh, twenty teens, what, what what not the oddies? What, what, right. what are you teens now? I guess it's the teens. I mean, yeah, right. we're the teens again. It always right. disappoints me that no one has officially ruled on either of those things. Like we say right. the odds, or we say the, I, I can't wait for the next decade because we all know it'll be the twenties. Great, <laughs> we can right. stop it's, worrying yeah, about this. It's going to remove a lot of uh, a yeah. lot of that linguistic uh, frustration. Right. But by, by the time you get to to this era, uh, uh, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. This, this, it's, it's, it's not. It's, it, it, I don't know. It's the same but different, right? It's, mm. it's faster. You know, that's why like dealing with it now. The, the people that are online now, now it's everybody, right? Right. It's, My mom was not different. online right. in 1995, exactly. but she is now. Exactly. And and she might very well be fooled by something where I would look at that for two seconds and say, well, it's not an HTTPS domain, so it's not secure. And boy, their font choices are a little suspicious. <laughs> Maybe that's not a real news thing. Maybe I shouldn't click on it and put my social security number into it, but you know, you know, somebody who's not technically savvy will be fooled by that. And that's not, you know, not, I'm not trying to say that, you know, everybody in the modern Internet era is so dumb that they're going to be fooled. Uh, but it's a different population. I mean, one of the things that Slashdot had as its advantage is there was sort of a core uh, set of principles and beliefs and understanding. Everybody that was there, there was a very good chance that they were in college or had graduated from college. So you have a certain language level. They, they, it was an English speaking college, pro most likely. Uh, they all, a huge percentage of them would be technical. So, you know, they would understand, you know, why uh, C is a better language to program in, in 20, or in 1999 than Pascal. Uh, you know, like there's a, just a huge body of shared 
understanding uh, that allowed them to push a lot of details to the side and kind of focus on one on these new specific stories. Well, now uh, uh, every forum has everybody. And there's a lot of people in a lot of forums that maybe don't understand the existing community, the existing cultural norms. And there's a lot of people of differing education and technical experience levels, so they are easily duped. Uh, and that can be done intentionally uh, by the malicious. It can be done you know, just for fun uh, by the trolls. Uh, and all that stuff happens. And that's, that's the nature of the modern net community. I mean, the ultimate... And, you know, you, you sort of see Twitter and Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, and they both go at it from different directions. Uh, Twitter is this unyielding fire hose of noise, and Facebook is this self-reinforcing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this, is, this is the world you believe in, and because you keep clicking on it, we're going to keep showing you more of it. And those two systems, they're doing different things, and they're both doing it in complete... Like neither of those things work in the era of Slashdot because you have a certain level of quality control with Slashdot, you know, by which I mean me in some cases reading the story and saying, no, that guy's lying. Uh, now, maybe I get that wrong, but then you only got to fool one people uh, and the one people that you got to fool hopefully knows something about the, the subject that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but also since Slashdot's only going to post 10 or 15 things a day, there's a natural ceiling for how much content you have to wade through. Now, the downside, of course, is that Slashdot's only going to talk about, you know, technology and maybe occasionally dip its toe into politics. And we're not going to cover that knitting very well. Uh, we're not the, the world's leading authority on, you know, how to uh, uh, raise a vegan family or something, uh, you know, but there's web forums for that. And there's people that go there and troll that in their own unique ways. And that's true of every single forum. So, Slashdot had that this great advantage for those early years that just doesn't exist really anymore because now communities are so diverse in terms of their audience, in terms of their subject matter, and in the the and because they can you can, I mean if you follow a hundred people on Twitter that you've carefully chosen, you can get through that without ever having any of your ideas challenged. Right. Uh, and there's nothing that we can do about that. Uh, like without some sort of dramatic change occurring. Uh, well, okay, that's interesting. Um, what sort of change? Like when you look at a Twitter or a um, you know YouTube comment sections or, or any of the other notorious uh, areas of the internet where trolls seem to thrive. When when you look at them, like, are there any lessons that you've learned over twenty years of doing this that you're like, you know, oh, oh yeah, you could do like what, like what? Well, okay, so the first lesson is that of your listeners, they should hire me and pay me exorbitant <laughs> sums of money, yes, uh, to uh, share my decades of of rich wealth and knowledge consultancy uh, on this yes. subject. I, I mean, I don't mean to brag, but I am fantastic at this kind of thing. Uh, no, I mean, each of these systems has you got to tackle it in different ways. Uh, and it's not that different, I think, than what Slashdot was doing back in the day. You know, you find this particular avenue of attack and you figure out what's an efficient way of dealing with it that doesn't break the system for too many people. Uh, there's there's things that uh, a lot of these systems need to deal with or they could deal with in different ways. And I'm sure that they all have qualified experts uh, doing their best. And I don't mean to belittle any of the systems because if anybody knows how hard it is being a decision maker – uh, uh, developing tools for a Facebook or a Twitter or a YouTube comment system. Believe you me, I know, and I don't envy uh, those positions. But there are things that they can try. Uh, but again, they all have, they're all double-edged swords. For example, just pick some random examples. Uh, you could try to directly integrate some sort of fact-checking into, into Google. They've tried that. Uh, you could integrate that fact-checking into Facebook, uh, so what if a story that comes through Facebook, uh, you know, it, you, it, it tells you this, this story is 83% lies or it's 6% deceptive or some sort of logical way to make it clear. Of course, they could also just not show things that are untrue. Uh, but that's counterproductive to what these systems are designed to achieve. Facebook wants to maximize their clicks. They want to maximize your time on site. Their first priority is to the almighty dollar and not to the you know the education or the an informed and educated populace which as you know it, maybe that sounds idealistic but that's what i tried to do with slash i wanted my readers to come out better 
for having read a story, understanding a subject. And yeah, sometimes you're going to get riled up, but I wanted my readers to know that. Uh, to 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 feel better for what uh, they were what they were reading, uh, you but so you can try that. But the, the problem that, again is that like you put, let's say you put a sticker next to a story that tells somebody that it's false. Well, then there's going to be a percentage of users who are just going to be like, well, clearly Facebook is being paid off by some other organization, which is going to mean they're only putting that sticker there because they're being paid off. Because conspiracy theorists are everywhere. They are powerful, and you cannot persuade them because they've got. Uh, you know, in some cases, decades of of paranoia uh, reinforcing uh, a certain mindset that nothing will crack them. Of. And this is this is a problem on the left and the right. This is a problem uh, throughout. But any 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 solution you come up with, you basically have to play some sort of three dimensional or fourth dimensional chess game. Uh, you know, because nobody's not everybody's going to believe you, and it's it, oh, it sucks, man. It's hard. It's just hard. Uh, I would love to play with like Facebook data or Twitter data uh, or you know Google data on one of these systems and see uh, like could like run experiments on populations like that. It would be really interesting because you could there there are things you can do. There there are other things that Slashdot did that I still think are uncapitalized on. I mentioned I think earlier in our chat uh, how our moderation system. Uh, gave and removed power from users over time. No, but no regular user was just always granted unlimited power over the slash dot moderation system. We did this to minimize abuse. Uh, and we also did this to, uh, uh, prevent boredom. Uh, and then ultimately people get bored and they don't participate in your system at all. Well, it also, uh, pre I, it also prevents like an aristocracy from forming. Yep. Like, I feel like that was the problem with dig. Um, so it, what you're saying is, is that your solution was you always have to earn your reputation. And, and, and once you earn it, if you, if you don't maintain it, you can lose it. But more than that, in the case of Slashdot, is even if you were – so I, I, I'd be guessing at numbers after all of these years. But even if only a third of the Slashdot population regularly gets moderation access, even if that's only, only a third of the population, maybe only 3% of them have access today. Uh, and it's a different 3% tomorrow. Right. Uh, you, you described it as like jury duty. Like yes. your, your number comes up and, and you're in charge for this period of time, but then it rotates out to somebody else. Right. And now if you, you know, applied concepts like that to uh, something like Facebook uh, or to, to retweets or something. But again, Twitter has this uh, this uh, just like Slashdot carried this boat anchor around its neck of we are a tech site for nerds. Twitter kind of has this boat anchor around its neck of we are a real time news feed and we don't generally monkey with the order of tweets. Uh, and that runs in direct contradiction to Facebook, which is like, I'm going to show you this thing from three weeks ago because your friend just liked it five minutes ago, even though it's about a game that happened, you know, back in back in August. But your friend liked it. And we know you really like your friend. I mean, they, they have completely philosophically different ways of tackling these problems. Um but again, you can you could figure out ways to roll in those ideas into those systems. But again, the, these are hard because if your goal is to uh, keep somebody on your platform to maximize your ad revenue, uh, man, people love to be told they're right. <laughs> uh, you know, nothing nothing makes you stick around longer than being told and reinforcing your pre existing notions. People hate being told they're wrong, so. It's it's it would be very difficult for them to do that in a successful way because you know changing your mind is it, it's hard <laughs> it requires effort it requires self evaluation uh, you know things that some people are totally comfortable with because maybe their their jobs require it uh or because you know their their life experience requires it and other people are just like no <laughs> i'm like if facebook if you showed uh if you started showing my uh uh i I'll, i won't name a name if you showed one of my gun nut relatives on facebook nothing but stories telling you true factually accurate statistics about uh, deaths related to guns in America, he would stop using Facebook. There's nothing that's going to, Facebook is not going to change his mind 
because he's made certain decisions. And I'm guessing that if you did the same thing to me and, you know, showed me the, showed me the opposite side of that story, uh, that I would not change my mind either. Now I don't, you know, care necessarily if I read Facebook or not, but yeah, that's the, he, I don't know if these are the platforms for changing people's minds. And ultimately, I think that's kind of the heartbreak is that uh, these problems go back to the education system. They go back to, you know, teaching kids, you know, what's real and what's false and how how to how to critically look at information, you know, when they're when they're young. Uh, And that's that is a hard problem. And I don't think that everybody is capable of making that kind of rational and honest sort of decision. I mean, cause it's hard. <laughs> it's just hard to be told you're wrong. And that's the struggle with these communities. It's easier to find a community of people that agree with you, uh, than to have your beliefs challenged. Well, you know, I think you might've been a little tongue in cheek and joking about, uh, you know, being a, a, being hired as a consultant on these things, but I'm not joking at all because like I said, I don't think there's very many people that have as much experience with these sorts of things as you do. So, uh, if anybody's looking for a community consultant, uh, Rob's available, I think, right? Oh, yeah. I'm, uh, I am I play my guitar in the mornings, and I work in my wood shop in the evenings, and that's uh, – I won't complain. It's pretty sweet, but – well, okay, uh, <laughs> that's that's a good that's a good seg for the last question to wrap up All here, right. which is, um, uh, what are you excited about today? And 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 so, for some people, the answer is uh, this new startup that I'm about to launch, or you know, oh, this is plug time, or, right? Exactly, or or it I'm could really be excited about my new Netflix series. So. I'm really <laughs> excited about AI; it's the future. Or like you know, oh, Malik was like, I just really have gotten into photography. So, uh, final question is, uh, what are you excited about today? Whatever it is, Rob, go. <laughs> oh man, uh, I, I the last few years I've been building a wood shop. Uh, mm-hmm. Right now I'm learning how to turn wood. Uh, I'm making pens and bottle stoppers. Uh, oh, I try wow. to practice. I try to practice my guitar. Oh yeah, I'm making cabinets, uh, some small furniture. Uh, I practice my guitar whenever possible. Uh, I try to minimize my time consuming news online uh, and make my consumption of news efficient. Uh, sadly, none of the major news platforms achieve what a smart set of RSS feeds still can achieve. I have a hundred RSS feeds. I can read a hundred RSS feeds headlines very quickly, uh, and know both sides of the story. I can subscribe to Breitbart and, uh, MSNBC and get both sides of the story, uh, if I need to. And I can do that pretty darn efficiently, uh, uh, if I'm willing to put forth, uh, a little bit of effort. Uh, but I mean, I, uh, spend time with my kids, uh, uh, and, uh, occasionally I have been known to do some freelance work here and there, uh, uh, some related to subjects we have discussed on this very program. Uh, I am, as you might've noticed, somewhat passionate about these subjects, Uh, but I don't, uh, it's not like in the middle of Michigan, people are just showing up at your doorstep, knocking on your door and saying, Hey, I got this, uh, this, uh, multi-million user community. Uh, you know, I, would really like some assistance, uh, with that. That's not really a Michigan problem. It's more like, uh, somebody was saying on, on, on a forum, you know, there's a cow, uh, in, on my lawn and then somebody else is like, Oh, that's my cow. I'll come and get it. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I try to, you know, relax, keep a low profile, hang out with my kids. Uh, not, I tell you, not traveling all the time is pretty sweet. Uh, I never particularly cared for that. Uh, but you know, if anybody needs, like, uh, you know, needs to commission some small woodwork or something, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always open for that. I'm, uh, I, I, I've got uh, in my eyes, I, my line of, said, oh, I've got, I've, I've got a five thousand piece Lego Millennium Falcon, ten ah. pound, five <laughs> bottle stoppers, like in my frame of vision right now these are the things that uh i will spend my day on uh, after i after i shake my fist angrily at uh uh, freaks on the internet well i think the takeaway there is like uh nick offerman when parks and rec ended uh you're a woodworker now (laughs) you're you're a, a man that works with his hands but uh that's that's great um but rob Rob Malda, thank you so much. Uh, this I was super excited to do this one because I do feel like that that the story of of Slashdot and and your career online 
is weirdly so very relevant right now. So thanks for thanks for remembering all that and 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 explaining you know the lessons learned and, and all that great stuff. No problem. Now I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna have to hang up with you and then go listen to uh, uh, the Jason X episode of the podcast. That I'm, uh, <laughs> the, the, the How did this get made? Podcast. That's right, what right, I'm right. Obsessed with right now. Yeah, yeah. It's Jason X this week. It's Halloween, man. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Rob. Anytime. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes. Because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at NetHistoryPod, and my personal Twitter is at BrianMCC. Thanks for listening.